Hey friends, I'm Otis Gibbs, and this is my buddy Gurf Morlix. He's going to share some stories about the time he spent producing and touring with Lucinda Williams. You know, we were both living in L.A., and uh, she was part of this gig that someone put together called Millions of Williams. And it was uh, Lucinda and Victoria Williams and the Williams Brothers were playing a gig in Hollywood. And she needed a band from L.A. She was bringing David Grissom in, I think, to play guitar. Um, but she needed a band, and, and I was the drummer was hanging at my house. And, and so I drove him over there and uh, watched the rehearsal. And then I think maybe I just played the guitar because the guitar player hadn't gotten there yet. And then I just kind of became the guitar player in that band. And we were scuffling. We were playing in Hollywood clubs. We'd get. I remember one night we played Raji's, and we made $8.00. And she called me the next day. I had left before getting paid. And she said, you know, I owe you $2 from last night. I said, well, let's just let that ride for a while. You know, I still haven't gotten it. She called up one day and she said, we got a record deal. And uh, this rough trade from England, is, they were kind of a punk rock label, I think. And, uh, and there was a guy named Robin Hurley that really liked Lucinda's music and uh, and they offered her a deal, and she said, who's going to produce it? And I said, well, I will. And just kind of slowly pulled my foot out of my mouth and did it. Had you ever produced anything before? Uh, not an album that came out like that, but um, I had, you know, I was always the guy in the band uh, who could run a tape recorder and know where to put the mics, and, you know, I knew what it was supposed to sound like. It was just Seems like common sense to me, but seems like most people don't have it. Yeah, we had Dusty Wakeman Engineering at, at Mad Dog Studio in L.A., and uh, it, it was it was just easy, you know. Was, and I was just, you know, I was just trying to recreate Late for the Sky and For Every Man, the Jackson Brown albums. I just, I loved those, and I was just, that was my template, you know. It was easy. And, you know, you, you, you start with great songs and a singer who can put them across, and, and you got to have a great drummer. And then beyond that, it's just don't fuck it up. And then suddenly, you know, we, suddenly we were on tour. We did a national tour, and uh, and there were people showing up every night. You know, we show up in Minneapolis, and there's 300 people there standing on the floor. And it was just, it was press and a, and a really good album with a really good bunch of songs. Lucinda and I, as a duo, were booked to play this uh, festival, a summer summer festival in Birmingham, Alabama. And we're getting on the plane, just a, a cattle call to get on, you know. And uh, slowly, you know, people are slow, stowing their luggage, you know. And so we're just, you know, we got on in the in the first class compartment, but everything is going really slow. And, and I look in the back left corner in front of the bulkhead, I see James Brown on the plane. Last row of the of first class. And so standing there, and I, I just, I'm going to play it cool here. You know, I nudged Lucinda, and I said, Lucinda, look. And I motioned over there, and and she turned, and she thought I was talking about the guy standing in front of her in line, and he had a T-shirt on that had like a long paragraph and so she's just standing there for like, I don't know, a minute or something, just not doing anything. And then she turns back to me and she goes, what? I don't, I don't get it. What? I said, what were you looking at? She goes, this guy's T-shirt. I go, no, no, in the corner in the last seat. And she looks over there and she screams, it's James Brown. <laughs> and all of a sudden, everybody on the plane erupts. And then... We got there, our seats were right behind the bulkhead. And there were a lot more people coming on after us. You know, they're, they're real boarding by section, you know. And so everybody that had come past the bulkhead had just seen James Brown. And I never saw a bunch of happier people in my life getting on that airplane. So then we got to uh, Birmingham and we're in the... In the airport, I see James getting picked up in his long white limo. And then we go to this hotel. It was an old, uh, nice downtown Birmingham hotel um, that had 
built on a, another wing next door that was a high rise. So in the lobby of this hotel, uh, and there's this festival's going on, so there's all kinds of acts and uh, and people are all milling about and we're getting our rooms and and all of a sudden I see these people starting to come out of the offices behind the counter of the hotel. Uh, a whole bunch of black people were coming out and these workers at the hotel and they were just kind of excited and I'm going, what's going on? And all of a sudden I see James enter with his valet and a, and a babe on his arm. And uh, he's going, he's been checked in already. And so these people all buzzed about it, they knew. And he's going to turn to go up the escalator to the new wing. And he sees all these people coming out of the offices and he just did a little step and he went, ow! And went up the escalator. <laughs> it was the coolest thing I'd ever seen. And oh, everybody in the lobby, and by this point, there were, you know, 50 or 60 people on it, and we all just burst into spontaneous applause. It was, <laughs> there was no thinking involved. It was just, ah! I was on tour with Lucinda, and I think it was 89, and uh, her father was a poet, professor, um, and a friend of Tom T. Hall. And we got to Nashville, and... Uh, she said, Tom T. wants us to come over for dinner. We had a night off. And I was thinking, you know, I, I don't like some of those songs, you know. I, I didn't know much of his material. I knew there were some good songs, uh, but there were some that were so simple and childlike that I just did not like them. And I had done my fair share of bad-mouthing some Tom T. Hall songs. And I thought, well, I'll go for dinner. That could be interesting. And he sent a limo for us took us way out in the country to his house, and I'm thinking, well, this is going to be weird, but it's a free meal, you know? And uh, and we got out there, and Tom T. introduced us to Miss Dixie, his wife, and and he was he was friendly, and it was kind of very nice, and, uh, and then he told Miss Dixie, he said, oh, by the way, Larry Gatlin called, and he's coming for dinner tonight, too. No, Larry Gatlin, ah, double whammy, you know? I was like, oh, man. And then over the course of about 15 minutes more conversation, I realized that Tom was joking and felt the same way about Larry Gatlin that I did. <laughs> I just, I, it took me a while to tumble. And Tom T. was great. He was a gentleman and told hilarious, funny stories and, it was it was an absolute pleasure to meet him and get to hang out. He played a song. I, I, I think there was only one guitar there, and I think he played a new song that he'd written. And I, I remember liking it. It was nice. He was a great songwriter and a real character. I, I wish I'd known him more. What a songwriter. Amazing. What a catalog, you know. Just, and, a, and a fine, funny human being. I just... I, I, I was young, you know, I, I didn't know anything at the time, you know, I was, I was in my thirties, you know, it was just, a, I, I didn't even become a, an adult till I was about 38, you know, <laughs> Donald Lindley on drums, who was the best, one of the best musicians I've ever known, he's gone now, and, uh, and John Chambody on bass, uh, Dr. John. Uh, who was a chiropractor, he's gone now too. Uh, he played on, played bass on My Aim Is True album uh, with Elvis Costello, and he, he was said he was in Clover. I don't know if you remember that band with Huey Lewis and Bay Area band. They moved to England and hooked up with Elvis. And he became a chiropractor, yeah. But he was, he was just a great natural bass player. It was the greatest rhythm section I've ever played with. Yeah, they, you know, they had somehow, they read somewhere that this was a really good album and they showed up and they were just, they were ready. You know, it was, it was kind of surprising, you know. Our, you know, our first gig in New York was the bottom line, you know. I mean, there were some places, you know, where they weren't as aware, you know, we'd get to Knoxville or somewhere and, you know, it'd be a smaller crowd, but. Was it that record that you did, Austin City Limits? I'm trying to remember now. I know we did one. Just me and Lucinda, and it was in the round with Roseanne Cash and uh, and uh, Bruce Coburn. 
But then we finally, I think it might have been like 90 or 91, we, 92, I can't remember any of that stuff. We, uh, we did one with the whole band and it was, that was great. It was, it was magical. Well, it was a great band. You know, it was, it was like the Who backing up a singer-songwriter, you know. It was really powerful band and, and good songs, and, and uh, it, was, it was pretty remarkable. Were you hip to Austin City Limits at the time? Oh, yeah. You know, when I moved to Austin in 1975, early 75, and, and went to a lot of the shows. I saw Ry Cooter and uh, Flaco Jimenez and... You know, I saw the Nashville Super Pickers. You know, I'd, I'd, I'd go almost every week. You know, the tickets were free. Uh, it, you didn't have to enter a lottery to get a ticket, you know. <laughs> There's too many people out there now. You've got you to gotta, you gotta win the lottery to go to a national park, you know. I, you know, I'm not sure. I, I saw other people play um, later on play Austin City Limits shows and all of a sudden become way more known nationally. You know, I saw that happen to Jimmy LaFave because um, he hadn't toured like Lucinda did, you know, and uh, he wasn't well known, but suddenly he was and he could travel around the country and draw a crowd, you know, it's like, it is kind of magical. What was your stage volume like back then? Loud. I was playing through a twin reverb. I, you know, didn't matter where I, what size stage I was on. I could be outside in front of 15,000 people or in a club with 100 people. I'd set my twin on four. Were That's you, loud. Yeah. Were you using a tube screamer or anything like that? Uh, I, you know, I, I always used the MXR Dynacomp. I kind of was going for a clean slashing sound. I, I remember one time we played in, in London... And it was like a, you know, it was like, like Dylan getting booed or something. You know, there was there was some hardcore folkies there, and and I think I was playing through a Marshall four twelve cabinet or something, and it's theater. Uh, but you know, I I know I've been doing this all my life. I know how to, you know, don't tell me I'm too loud because I'm the correct volume. You know, the sound person is in charge of making it all balanced. You know. And somebody said, eh, turn it down the guitar so we can hear the lady sing. And Lucinda lit into him. She said, hey, we're, we're doing what we do. You, you adapt, you know. She was good about stuff like that. I guess we ended up at car wheels or whatever. Um... Yeah, you know, we worked on that album a lot. We spent years and it just, you know, she had some problems and it just, you know, she kept putting it off because she wasn't happy with herself. And and it just turned into a, uh, I guess people would call it a toxic situation. It just, I wasn't feeling good about the relationship and, and it just got to the point where I, I was better off not being involved, so I quit. Well, I enjoyed playing those great songs live on stage. You know, it was just, all the songs from that, from that rough trade album are just really good, you know. Sweet Old World is about as good as a song can be. Uh, I just, you know, and the band was so good. It was, just, it was a, it was joy, except when it wasn't. Oh yeah, that that was, you know, that was the first real record that I produced, and that just turned into, you know, a long period of me producing records for a living. You know, there have there have been these arcs in my life, you know, and I just I don't see them till ten years later, but. I became a record producer after that, you know. I, I'm not sure I'm still a record producer. I, you know, I haven't, I haven't, uh, haven't had anyone in my studio in, since COVID started, and I haven't performed since COVID started. I, you know, it's it kind of like a forced retirement. I may, it may change. I don't know. I never, I don't see these things until I look back at them.